This is what you're fighting for. I mean, every day you're out there. What they're doing is blowing people off. If you continue to look the other way and shut up, then the oppressors, the authoritarians get total control and total power. Because this is just like in Arizona. This is just like in Georgia. It's another element that backs them into a quarter and shows their lies and misrepresentations. This is why this audience is going to have to get engaged. As we've told you, this is the fight. All this nonsense, all this spin, they can't handle the truth. War Room Battleground. Here's your host, Stephen K. Bannon. And thank you to Representative Tony Gonzalez, who works so hard every day on behalf of the communities he represents. You know, when I think back to one of my first conversations with Tony, the number one issue he talked about that was important to his district is addressing the historic border crisis. We've heard that firsthand from Border Patrol agents. I hear that from Border Patrol agents in my district along the northern border who have been transferred here over and over and over again. But make no mistake, this is not just a crisis in South Texas. This is a United States of America crisis. And it's a crisis as a result of Joe Biden and House Democrats' failed policies. This has gotten worse and worse every single month. It's the worst past year since we've been keeping track of the numbers. And we know it's only going to get significantly worse with Joe Biden's decision to lift Title 42. Today, I had the opportunity, as did my colleagues, to tour with our boat border patrol. And the two captains of our boat were the ones that recovered the body of Bishop Evans. Think about the emotional turmoil, the emotional anguish that these Border Patrol agents are going through every day, in addition to the National Guard and their families. Our hearts break. House Republicans are unified in securing the border and providing the support we need to our Border Patrol and our communities in South Texas and across the country. I now want to turn it over to the House Republican Policy Chair, Gary Palmer. Okay, welcome. It is Tuesday, 26 April, the year of our Lord, 2022. Your live war room a battleground. Uh, Boris Epstein. Boris, thank you for joining me. He'll be co-hosting uh, for the entire hour. We're very honored. In the, in the previous hour, we just went through Specialist uh, Bishop Evans giving his life, not simply in defense of his country on the southern border, but also there's no greater love than someone who lays down his life for his fellow man. Specialist Evans gave his life for what they found out later were two uh, illegal aliens that were uh, smuggling narcotics. Uh, so uh, a very a tragedy, and we had Royce White, Vernon Jones, Raynard Jackson on here to discuss. We're very honored in this hour to have uh, the first part of the show, uh, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik. She's chairwoman of the Republican Conference. That was her. She was on the border. Our audience is very familiar with Eagle Pass, Texas. We do a lot of broadcasting from there. Congresswoman uh, Stefanik, Chair, Chairwoman Stefanik, please tell us your, your impressions. You were down at Eagle Pass. Uh, you're calling in today from the House floor right off it. Give us your impressions of, of what you saw and what, what, what are the takeaways as the conference uh, chairman uh, that you, uh, you think is important? Well, thank you so much for inviting me to be on your show. So first, our heart breaks as a nation for the loss of um, Specialist Bishop Evans, who lost his life. And as you said, he's laid down his life. He jumped into the water to save those who were illegally crossing and reportedly trafficking drugs into our country. What a loss for Texas. What a loss for the United States of America. Uh, when we arrived, the body had been identified by the River Rear Boat Patrol uh, hours beforehand. Actually, we were beginning our briefing by the Border Patrol leadership of the Del Rio sector when that news broke. I then had the opportunity to do a, a visit on site on the actual boat with the two captains who recovered the body. So think about, as I said, the, just the stress that our Border Patrol officers, that our National Guardsmen and women are under on a daily, hourly basis. The other part of the meeting that didn't get a lot of press coverage but was incredibly powerful was we met with uh, ranch owners, local business owners. These are grown middle-aged men who uh, are strong Texans, broke down in tears to talk about just the risk of their livelihood, the risk to their family members, the fact that their children uh, have to make sure they are carrying pistols on their property to protect themselves. That's why our Second Amendment rights are so important. But this is an invasion at our southern border, and we know that President Trump's policies were working. You hear that 
not just from Republicans, but from locally elected Democrats say that President Trump's policies were working and it's been a catastrophe under Joe Biden. The other note I want to make, Steve, to make sure your listeners are aware, as we were uh, visiting the facility that the Border Patrol officers and ICE manage when it comes to uh, the illegal aliens who are processed, and they are in, you know, very humane conditions. I mean, our Border Patrol officers are just doing incredible, incredible work. They uh, shouldn't be pushed to this limit at all, and they're under tremendous stress. But the U.S. government, the U.S. taxpayer, is giving illegals cell phones. That shocked me. They give them brand-new cell phones, and these aren't old cell phones. These are nice iPhones, uh, to track them. So think about that. The U.S. taxpayers are paying for that. I was so shocked. I thought it was facial recognition to potentially run through a database. No, it was facial recognition to set up the cell phone that they hand over to the illegal uh, after they're released into the country. So this is dire. And what you hear from the Border Patrol leaders and the Border Patrol folks on the front line is this is going to get so much worse with the lifting of Title 42. And Joe Biden and House Democrats, they do not care. This is a crisis. It impacts every community across the country, including mine in northern New York, where I represent Border Patrol families. And those officers have been transferred over and over and over to the southern border, uh, which not only doesn't meet our needs at the northern border, but it just shows the stress that these Border Patrol heroes are under every single day. Uh, Congressman uh, Boris, you want to jump in? Yeah. No, go ahead, Boris. I know you got a question. No, no doubt about it. Here, here's, here's my question for you, and thanks so much for joining us, uh, Chairman. This means, this means so much to the War Room Posse, and you going down there, not for a photo op, but to show leadership, and to, obviously there with Leader McCarthy, with MTG, others. You, you went down there to show leadership and to, to truly work toward action. What can the Republicans in the House and the Senate be doing now, between now and elections, in, in November, in order to in order to handle this and and try to push the feckless, pathetic Biden administration to get to a solution, what can we do now before we take control of the House and the Senate in November, uh, in the elections in November, and it gets sworn in in January? Well, we have to use every legislative tool possible to fight back against Joe Biden's open border amnesty policies. I'll tell you what we're doing this week. We have Secretary Mayorkas testifying in front of multiple committees, the House Judiciary Committee, House Homeland Committee. Our Republican members are prepared. We are prepared to hold him and Joe Biden accountable for their dereliction of duty. Another legislative tool we have is what's called a discharge petition. That ensures that if you get a certain number of signatures of House members on the House floor, it forces a vote. Uh, we have had a discharge petition for over a year when it comes to keeping strong border security policies in place uh, that President Trump had in place. For example, Title 42, not allowing Joe Biden to lift Title 42. Uh, if Democrats give lip service, every single one of them should find that discharge petition if they care uh, about solving this border crisis. And you see they're already on the run in states like Arizona, in some of these swing districts. You see, uh, you know, the, the fake moderate Senator Mark Kelly uh, trying to save the border's crisis. Where have they been this past year fighting against Joe Biden's failed policies? We're going to hold them accountable in the hearings, but we're going to hold them accountable on the House floor. And if they care about this, they can sign that discharge petition and join Republicans to ensure that we are fighting back against Joe Biden's reckless, reckless, dangerous open border policies. Uh, uh, Chairwoman uh, Stefanik, I got to ask you, you were, I think, the first that came out and said, this is not this is not business as usual down there. This is an invasion of the United States of America. Now, you've had a chance to go to Eagle Pass. You've had a chance to talk to people, etc. And our concept here is every state's a border state. I just want you to put it. Can you put it in, particularly when you go back and talk to your colleagues about the scale of what this invasion is and the impact it's having on Hispanic Americans down in South Texas and the Rio Grande Valley, ma'am? Well, it is an invasion. You do not have a, a country if you don't have secure borders. And I'll tell you, even though I'm along the northern border, because I hear from the Border Patrol officers weekly in my district about the challenges on the southern border, in addition to law enforcement leaders in my district at the state and local level who are seeing skyrocketing overdoses when it comes to the fentanyl crisis, that's all coming in across the southern border. So as a House Republican conference chair, 
Every single member of House Republicans understands that this is not just the southern border crisis. Every state, every county, every city, every town in America is a border state, county, city, town. So every district is a border district. When it comes to our opportunity this November, we have strong candidates running on this issue to secure the border and look no further than South Texas. At the local level, we won key local races, but we have a number of seats that are targeted that we think we're going to win back. Uh, in fact, there's a special election coming up in Texas 34 that we think we can flip. It, we can flip. This is Myra Flores, who I believe was on this show. She knows firsthand about this crisis. Her husband is a U.S. Border Patrol officer. So when we talk about opportunities and polling shifts among American voters, but also Hispanic voters, Hispanic Americans see that they want economic opportunity. They want safety and security. They want secure borders. They do not want these harmful, dangerous, destructive, open border policies that we're seeing under Joe Biden. And when the reason I use the, word, the term invasion is look at the numbers, Steve and Boris. This is just unprecedented. These are more illegal immigrants that have been apprehended since we've been counting, since our nation has been keeping that record. And I go back to under the Obama administration, Secretary of Homeland Security Jay Johnson said if there were a thousand a day, that would be a very, very bad day in a crisis. There are, uh, we're already at the 7,000 mark. Think about that. When Title 42 is lifted, it's going to likely be close to 18,000 per day. Think about it. It was Obama's own. Secretary of Homeland Security said a thousand would be a catastrophe. We're looking at potentially 18,000 with these decisions of Joe Biden. So this is an invasion. It is a catastrophic crisis. November can't come soon enough. But House Republicans are going to do everything we can, use every legislative tool, every oversight capability in these congressional hearings to hold this administration accountable. Uh, Boris, you got uh, you got a question? No doubt about it. And, you know, Congresswoman Stefanik is somebody who, during the 2020 campaign, when we did the pushback against the Democrat National uh, Convention, and we had this show called The Real Joe Biden, and we had, you know, big names come and see us. She was one of the very, very few actual sitting members of Congress to make the track over to campaign headquarters in Virginia late. It was like 10, 30, 11 at night. And she was on the show with us pushing back on Joe Biden. She was also she also did a panel with us on Israel during the Republican National Convention. So she's been a champion for us, champion for MAGA. Obviously such an important key role in pushing back on both the awful fake impeachments, impeachment one and impeachment two. So first of all, Chairman, I want to thank you for your continued leadership and continued devotion to MAGA, so important, so vital. As we drive toward November of, of this year and then drive to November of 2024, how should this audience be focused on ensuring huge wins? We talk about 100 seats for a control of 100 years for November 22. How can this audience be most focused on ensuring those victories in November of 22 and then gearing up for November of 24 when, as we all hope, President Trump wins the White House and walks back into the White House in January of 25. Well, certainly Republicans are not going to uh, think that we have this uh, one today. We're going to earn this historic majority. We are six months from the election, and we are going to work hard every single day. We're working with candidates across the country, and I'm so proud that these first-time candidates are stepping up, these America First candidates who believe that we need to save this country from the socialist far-left policies that we've seen under a unified far-left Democrat government. Um, that's what I'm focused on. What I'm also focused on is pushing back on the mainstream media narrative that refuses to cover issues that are important to the American people. I've got to give you guys credit. You've been on this border crisis uh, for years, uh, not only through this program, but also leading up, obviously, under uh, the historic 2016 presidential campaign. Uh, the key issue that I think President Trump won on was build the wall, which has worked. And everybody along the southern border will tell you that. That has been an effective policy that has been shredded under Joe Biden. The mainstream media doesn't want to talk about this. We need to continue to pressure them to talk about issues like the inflation crisis, like the constitutional crises we face every day, particularly under the authoritarian COVID regime, like the shredding of constitutional norms that we experience from the authoritarian Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and uh, Leader Chuck Schumer from uh, my blue state. We have an opportunity to win back not just Republican voters, but really going beyond people that are looking for 
uh, an economically safe, a strong country, a pro-America vision for the future. And I'm seeing it in New York, Boris and Steve. I mean, we're traditionally a blue state. Um, I always work to earn support across party lines, just like, frankly, President Trump did in my district. He won about, you know, a quarter of Democrats in my district as well as I did. People are tired of what they are seeing under blue far left leadership. It has been a war against law enforcement and, frankly, uh, a war against the taxpayers in terms of this bloated spending and hardworking people are really suffering under this inflation. That is the number one issue that I hear uh, from everywhere I go in my district, everyone I talk to across America. And people understand it's a result of Joe Biden, and Nancy Pelosi and Democrats. And a lot of the media doesn't want to talk about it. They want to continue to focus on their Trump derangement syndrome. But as the House Republican Conference chair, I'm focused on issues that impact people's daily lives, which is why I went to the border to hear firsthand, to listen firsthand. And because my local Border Patrol officers are on the front lines every single day facing this, we get calls from their wives, from their families. This is important to every community across America, and we have to win in November. Uh, 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 Chairwoman Stefanik, uh, the last question. You've committed to making the MAGA movement more inclusive, to, to make this populism more participatory. As you go around with both women, African Americans, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, walk us through. What, what, what is your pitch? When, when you're trying to recruit the, this, and Myra Flores was fantastic. We just had Vernon Jones and Royce White on here in the last hour. The energy is unbelievable. But when you're talking to a, a Myra Flores, when you're talking to African American candidates who are trying to get in here, what is your, what is your pitch to them? How, how do you walk them through it that we're an inclusive movement uh, and we're only getting stronger? Well, it is an inclusive movement. I don't have to expand it. It is an inclusive movement. I mean, that is the untold story that the mainstream media refuses to tell, is that President Trump expanded the party in historic ways, whether it was his support among African-American voters, whether it was his support among Hispanic-American voters. And we are building upon that just like he's building upon it. It's why we're working as one team and why I was honored to have the support from President Trump when I ran for conference chair to replace Liz Cheney. Uh, And these candidates are stepping up. I'm so proud that we have pro-Trump candidates, pro-America, MAGA candidates running across the country who are going to win their primaries. This will be the highest number of Republican women ever on the ballot uh, this November. We've broken the record already of the number who are running this year compared to last cycle. And remember, last cycle was the year of the Republican women. Um, I think we will elect over 50 Republican women uh, in Congress, which think about that even Boris. Two cycles ago, it was 13. And because of our efforts, and I was proud to lead that effort, think about how much that has grown. Because we're reflective of the movement, which is diverse. People are looking for leadership. They're looking for results. And they're not buying this far left socialist garbage that Democrats are selling. I love that. Chairwoman uh, Stefanik. Yeah, I love it. Can we get uh, can we get your social media? How do people follow you? How do people find out more about you? Elise Stefanik, follow me on Truth on Twitter, which is finally freeing up thanks to Elon Musk. But I'm also on Truth, and you can follow me at EliseForCongress.com. Go to my website. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be on the show. Honored to have you on. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks.